history revision podcast on the February Revolution. Let's have a look at the background to the revolution. Let's have a look at the long term political causes. We've got the Duma and its lack of real power. We've got Nicholas's character- characteristics, personality, and his belief in autocracy. We've got the creation of the Zemstvers. We've got the politicisation of the working classes, especially in growing towns and cities. We've got the lack of reform after Alexander II's brief period of reform. And we've got the role of Rasputin, although whether that's long term is debatable. We've got the long term social causes, the growth of the cities and the poor conditions there. We've got the lack of change to peasantry and conditions there. The emancipation in the UK in Salipin's reforms weren't really enough to make people happy. We've got the long-term military causes, the conscription of peasants, uh, the Russian desire for expansion somewhere. And so there are overall the long-term causes in both military, social and political. Let's have a look at the mid-term causes. Political first. The Duma were not given more powers during World War I. Progressive bloc were formed. We've got the success of the Zemstvers in, in the war which was undermining autocracy. You've got the Tsar taking personal control of the army, leaving the Tsarina, who was German, and Rasputin in charge, which led, in turn, to increasing hatred of Rasputin. And that made the uh, Tsar lose support of the Liberals and his traditional supporters and the nobility. The uh, merry-go-round of incompetent Prime Ministers, for example, Goryemkin, and other ministers during the war. This led to fuel and food, food shortages due to a lack of organisation. The social causes in midterm um, are the fuel and food shortages due to a lack of organisation, especially in the cities in World War One. The inflation leading to a uh, stockpiling of food by the peasants. And we've got the midterm military causes, the army requisition of food, fuel, men, transport led to shortages and um, it, shortages of everything really in um, the general population. The poor organisation led to lack of shells and weapons. Poor military performance due to poor leadership led to a poor morale in the army and in the general, the army, and in general. Uh, the Tsar's poor appointments of generals culminating in his taking personal charge which renders Tsarism Zar- dependent on military success is a mid-term military cause. And conscription meant that most soldiers were peasants and workers are actually sympathetic to the, the people in Russia. Let's have a look at the events of February 1917 then. Sometimes called the March Revolution because most, in most of the world it happened in March. Russia is on the Gregorian calendar so 12 days behind everybody else at this point. In January there were 30,000 workers on strike in Moscow and 150,000 demonstrating in Petrograd on the anniversary of Bloody Sunday. There were 1.5 million deserters from the army. By February 100,000 workers from 58 factories were on strike in Petrograd. The Duma were calling for the Tsar to go because of the food shortages uh, and that because he wouldn't give them any power to deal with the problems in Petrograd. Rodzianko warned the Tsar of serious unrest. On February 19, news which turned out to be untrue and just rumour that the bread would be further rationed from March 1st increased queues at bakeries which often got violent and police struggled to control them. Some of the police actually sympathised with the, uh, the queuers. February 22nd, 20,000 workers from the Putilov factory went on strike due to a pay argument. The next day on February 23rd, it was an International Women's Day and a traditional march turned political asking for food and an end to the war. Although Bolsheviks tried to persuade the women to return home so they wouldn't jeopardise the May protests that they planned, many people, for example workers from the Putilov and other workers, militant students, women from the bread queues, joined the women who were on the march and that led to 240,000-ish who were out on the streets. Trams were blocking the road as female drivers refused to drive them and they um, blocked in any male drivers who wanted to drive them. Over the next three days protesters became more radical, showing revolutionary clothes and banners and singing revolutionary songs, destroying imperial statues etc. There wasn't any organisation, but revolutionaries were stirring things up with political banners demanding an end to the war rather than just demanding bread. But it was an atmosphere where political protests are indistinguishable uh, indistinguishable from out- an outcry against food shortages really. Some soldiers shot protesters, some of them crucially joined them. On February 26th the Tsar closed down the Duma 
but 12 members of it refused. Rodzianko wrote to the Tsar about the atmosphere and that only major compromises could help him. The Tsar again ignored him. On February the 27th, the Tsar orders the army to deal with the protesters. Pretty much martial law, although the order couldn't be printed, such was the breakdown of normal life at that time, and 40 demonstrators were killed, and riots then became revolution. Soldiers were peasants, sympathetic to the um, people who were starving, and the officers were middle class intellectuals. One mutiny in the Volnitsky regiment spread elsewhere, and 66,000 soldiers joined the revolution, giving the revolutionaries 40,000 rifles. The police were overrun. The 12 members of the Duma, who refused to leave, formed a special committee which demanded the Tsar's abdication, including Alexander Kerensky was one of those. It was the first open defiance of the Tsar. The army generals told the army to give it their support and go back to the barracks. Some did, some did not. The Soviets were set up, and originally the Mensheviks dominated it. Factories were then invited to elect deputies to the Soviet. On February the 28th, Nicholas left a military HQ for Petrograd. His train was stopped by the workers. The Kronstadt naval base also mutinied, and soldiers forced the Soviet to accept soldier, soldier deputies. Order number one was produced on February the 28th, and that was an order to um, every unit had to elect a soldiers committee. All unit was to elect a deputy to the Petrograd Soviet. Army units were to be under control of the Soviet. The Duma was only to be obeyed if it agreed with the Soviets. Weapons were to be controlled by the soldiers committees, not the officers. Soldiers were to have the citizens' rights when they were off duty. Generals were now to be called Mr. General colonels called Mr. Colonel etc and they didn't have their previous honorific noble titles. Officers were n um, not to use the informal use of the word you like to in French uh, to soldiers. In March on March the 1st the chief of staff Alexeyev calls for the Tsar to abdicate in favor of his son. On March the 2nd Nicholas abdicates but not in favour of his son, in favour of his brother Michael. The provisional government was formed by members of the Duma and it was accepted by the Petrograd Soviet, but it, the Petrograd Soviet refused to surrender control of the army. So the short-term political courses were the Duma refusing to dissolve and attacking the Tsar, revolutionary banners handed out, Nicholas ignoring the serious nature of the situation, the Tsar ordering the army to fire on protesters, the setting up of the Soviet agrees to recognise the Duma. The Duma members setting up the Provisional Committee of 12 and then the Tsar abdicating in favour of his brother, not his son. The short-term social causes were the workers on strike due to shortages and pay disputes, the workers on the streets due to International Women's Day, bread rationing or rumours of it, Soviet being created, the Tsar's symbols destroyed by workers. Short-term military causes were deserters army firing on protesters and then mutinying and joining the protesters. Order number one, the mutiny at Kronstadt, the army high command advising the Tsar to abdicate and the Soviet controlling the army when the provisional government takes over. So now we need to have a quick look at the historical interpretation of the February Revolution. There's three groups, liberal historians, Soviet historians and revisionist historians, and the liberal historians got their information from the Russian noble emigres who'd fled Russia because they didn't like the Bolsheviks. And they tend to downplay the role of the revolutionaries uh, and the people in general and class struggle, saying that Russia was stabilising and modernising slowly before World War One, and that it was that event, World War One, along with the Tsar's incompetence after it and during World War One, which led to the revolution. They're anti-communists, so obviously they're going to be biased against them. Soviet historians were expected to play up the role of the Bolsheviks and the class struggle element, saying how people were merely continuing the revolutionary movement demonstrated in 1905 and in 1912 to 14 when the strikes happened there, and the Bolsheviks were instrumental in politicising them during the war and during the February Revolution. They downplayed the role of the Tsar and World War I, saying that revolution was inevitable even if the Tsar hadn't been incompetent and if the war hadn't started. They're obviously pro-communist and therefore biased towards them. 
Revisionist historians agree with much of the Soviet's theories, but because they're writing about the pressure of the Soviet without the pre pressure of the Soviet regime, they downplay the Bolshevik influence and say that the revolution, whilst it was a class struggle, was more spontaneous than planned, and even though the peasants were politically aware, they were just fed up with the shortages of war and the incompetence of the Tsar. The Bolsheviks were disunited during World War One, and they mostly weren't even there in Russia, especially in Petrograd, in February 1917.